Hey, as you hopefully all remember, uh, last time I spoke, I finished off the Love Language series as I was explaining, and the last talk was on gifts and gift giving. And um, so that's what I was hinting at this morning, sort of uh, being reminded of things. So uh, when I did the last talk, I touched on something that in all honesty, it really did impact on me. And I used the term, I hope everyone remembers this, I used the term the abundant mindset. And it's not original, I didn't come up with it myself. To be honest, I can't even remember um, where I first came across it. But this term, it really, it really got me thinking. Um, it is my mindset, everything I think and everything I feel, especially towards God and his purpose for us. Uh, and for me, is, is that mindset, is that mindset one of abundance, of generosity and love? Or do I slip down to my more uh, base nature, down to the other term that I use, down to the mindset of scarcity, uh, meaning, you know, greed, hatred, um, lust. So I want to go deeper into this concept of abundance uh, a little bit further this morning. I have heaps more examples and scriptures that time uh, last time didn't permit me to share. So I want to look uh, more closely, especially in regards to the abundant mindset in regards and relationship to God, in relationship to his word and his spirit. In other words, do we truly believe that we have God's spirit in abundance? Do we have God's love in abundance? Do we have God's blessing in abundance? Uh, because, to be frank, those would be all really great things to have in abundance if we have them. So hopefully we'll really ingrain, ingrain this terminology into our minds today and ensure that we have this abundance in God moving forward. Okay, so let's go. So first off, I want to make this clear that in referring to abundance, I'm not automatically referring to material wealth. Money, the things money can buy, things of that nature. Uh, unfortunately, Western society in particular has placed an emphasis on material accumulation whenever we think of abundance. So I don't want us to think so much about the material as we think of abundance. Instead, I want us to focus on the spiritual. While money and materials are nice to have, they cannot be our focus or the center of our attention. Our focus and our attention needs to be on God. Put God first in your life, submit ourselves to his will, and the rest will follow if that is God wants us to have. As Jesus said in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, and he was referring to material concerns, will be given to you as well. We must allow God to rule and reign in our hearts and our minds. Mm -hmm. When we have an abundance of God, we will truly have enough. So now I googled uh, other words for abundance, and the thesaurus gave me some brainy pigeons <laughs> who let me know what other words you can use in substitute of abundance. Again, let's not have material wealth as the focus when we're looking at these words. Instead, think on God. Abundance doesn't just mean to have plenty of money, but for us as Christians, as people of God, abundance can mean to have plenty of God's love, a wealth of God's joy, a profusion of God's peace, a plentitude of God's patience, a copious amount of God's kindness, a plethora of God's goodness, an affluence of God's faithfulness, an opulence of God's gentleness, a lot, and I do mean a lot, of God's self-control, and a huge, huge quantity of God's spirit. Now you may have noticed what I did there in associating the fruit of the spirit with the words associated with abundance. That's because God's spirit is key and central to having spiritual abundance. When we have God in our lives, we have his spirit. We have his blessing and we have his abundance. It's been a long time, but we, we sing that song, I have something that the world can't give. 
and the world can't take it away. Jesus, he's the one that the world can't give. And he keeps me night and day. The spirit of God contains an abundance that the world cannot understand or comprehend. The Bible even admits that the world finds this kind of abundance foolish. But they are the fools if they can't see what we see. What do we see? We see life everlasting, joy forevermore, and praise that never ceases. You can't get any more abundant than any of these things. Eternity, everlasting, never-ending, that is true abundance, true wealth, and true riches. And just on the screen, the question of the day, what is abundant in your life today? What, as Johnny was praying, what consumes you? What, what are you always looking for next? And hopefully it is God, more of God, God's spirit. Okay, so let's start looking at some scriptures to confirm what we've been talking about. The way I want to do this is I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible. And as we go through the story, we're going to pause, read some scriptures, and then continue. The story basically summed up, sums up the abundance versus scarcity narrative perfectly in my mind. And that story is that of the Exodus. Now, we all know the story of the Exodus. Hopefully. Hollywood blockbusters have been made about this. It's the backbone of, the, of Jewish history. And that is that slaves who were free from their oppressors by God through many miraculous works. But that part of history that tends to be skipped uh, in these movies is the 40 years of wilderness wandering due to their disobedience and lack of faith. Strange. So I'm just going to go back and make sure that. Now, wilderness tends to be extremely scarce when it comes to resources. Uh, even the basics, such as food and water, you tend to not be able to find an abundant amount of these things in a wilderness or in a desert. The only thing that tends to be abundant in the wilderness is sand and heat. <laughs> And the Israelites, they moan about the situation. There is not enough. They had the scarcity mindset. And in fact, this is the scarcity mindset wrapped up in a nutshell. The belief that God cannot supply for us. Hmm. Even though they had the presence of God right there with them. And it was represented to them by the pillar of fire and cloud. They claimed to not have enough. It really was fitting that the wilderness they found themselves in was actually a representative of their already existing mindset. Their faith was a wilderness. There was a short supply of trust, no patience, a lack of hope. But God, still being faithful, he still met their needs. And God promises that he can do the same for us. Exactly as it says in Philippians 4, verse 19, where it says, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God gave them manna from heaven, also called the bread of heaven and the food of angels. And they ate and they were satisfied for a time. <laughs> but eventually they even complained about this. Firstly, we had God cannot supply, and now what God does supply, this is boring, it's tasteless, it's not enough. More scarcity thinking going on here. We're sick to death of the same manna over and over again, day in, day out, it's this manna. And I think I'm going to be sick if I even have to see any more of this stuff. You know what I want? I want meat. <laughs> Just like we used to have in Egypt. The good old days, the days when we were satisfied. We had all those wonderful veggies and fish. Remember all of those things we used to eat? Man, I'm just salivating at the thought. I don't want God's supply. I want man's supply. Even if it means having to be a slave to me 
in order to get it. What terrible, rotten, backwards thinking. They wanted to go back to slavery in order to have their desires. They had no contentment in God's supply. Now we know from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 that God was testing which mindset the Israelites had. Was their trust in the name of the Lord or was their trust in the ways of man? And as it says in Deuteronomy 8, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, but then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. Why? To teach you. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus knew this verse was important. In fact, he quoted it himself when he had the exact same personal experience out in the wilderness where he was for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus hungered as well. But which mindset did Jesus have? We know that Jesus placed his trust in the Lord to supply and to minister. Which God did remember. How did God do this? He sent his angels to minister to Jesus, to feed Jesus. Israel, on the other hand, they did not trust. They grumbled, they complained, and all they saw was the lack, and all they saw was the impossible. <clears throat> so understandably, this made God angry. God is long-suffering, and as patient as he is, if there's anything that upsets him and makes him angry, it's definitely when people don't believe in him and when they doubt him. He answered Moses in Numbers 11 by promising Israel meat. If you want meat, though, I'll give you meat, all right? More meat than you can handle. More meat than you can stand. It's going to be coming out your ears by the time I've done supplying. And even then, Moses still doubted. What? Lord, we're in the middle of nowhere. Where is all this meat going to come from that you're promising? We don't have enough flocks, enough cows to feed everyone here. This is impossible. And that's when the Lord answered as he did in Numbers 11, verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's hand, referring to his ability and his power, has the Lord's hand become short? Or in other words, is it thwarted or inadequate? What God was saying here, you don't think that I'm able to do this? You don't think I'm able to do what I've promised? You shall see now whether my word shall come to pass for you or not. The, Israels, the Israelites sorry, didn't believe that God is able. Even the great man of faith in Moses didn't think God was going to be able. But God was able. He supplied for their needs. But sure enough, they regretted it soon after, as we know in the story. But we need to remember this. No matter the circumstance, no matter the obstacle, and, and while this verse wasn't around in their time, the principle was that no matter, what, no matter what the obstacle is, that we have a God who is able to bless us abundantly in all things, at all times, all that we need, we will abound in every good work. Israel wasn't yet ready to submit fully to God. They were still stuck mentally in Egypt. They hadn't yet learned the lessons. What was the lesson? That God is all they needed. As it says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, my grace is all you need. For my power is greatest when you are weak. God was pushing Israel to their limits, but he was still holding them by their hand. All the while, he was breaking them down to their very core, trying to free them from that scarcity mindset in order to free their minds. But they just weren't ready. Again, they saw nothing but wilderness. They saw no produce, and they thought all their remaining stock was about to disappear. But as Habakkuk 3, verse 17 and 18 says, 
we can experience the same circumstances too. We too can be hit by hard times. These times of uncertainty, times that lack clarity. But will we mumble and complain? Or will we be humble? Will we wait upon the Lord seeking his grace? Or, and will we rejoice in the Lord and take joy in the salvation of God as it says in Habakkuk? Will we possess the mindset of abundance that despite our circumstances, we still seek increase? Not just increase of the material, but increase of our faith and increase of our trust. And another song that we sing, though the fig tree does not blossom, there be no fruit on the vine. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. Bad times can seem to last forever and be especially cold and bitter. Droughts, famine, disease, war, these can all be at the extreme end. But we as humans, we also allow way more minor things to control us and dominate our thinking, our jobs, our bank balance, our possessions. When these things take a downturn, does our faith in God also take a downturn? When in actual fact, these situations always call for us to press harder into God, to show him that we trust him, and allow his purpose to instead dominate our thinking. When we wait in God, he promises us that he has the power to repair and to restore. We will easily wonder what all the fuss was about once we come out the other side. Joel 2, verse 25 and 26. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, a great army which I sent among you. But you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people never to be put to shame again. Truly that's what we desire. Restoration of those crawling, consuming and chewing years. Those hard times. Patience, trust, faith is what's required. Now, once we learn to trust God, to trust his plans for us, we start to be happy with everything he has given us. Even if that is by human standards, not that much, doesn't have to be a lot. But when we learn to trust God and start to have this happiness, we know this as contentment. As 1 Timothy 6 puts it, if we have godliness, such as faith, trust, love, and so on, and all these combined with this contentment equals abundance. First Timothy calls it great wealth. So true godliness and contentment in itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Hey, now it's time to conclude. I really... I really love this verse that God spoke here in Matthew 13, verse 12. I believe that he had the principle of the abundant mindset in his mind when he shared this. What is the has that Jesus is referring to here? Whoever has. In its context, he was speaking of knowledge and understanding. Whoever has understanding, more understanding shall be given. But the same can be said of all things within an abundant mindset. Whoever has faith, more faith shall be given. Whoever has love, more love shall be given. And so I could go on and on. And then he also explains the scarcity mindset straight after. Whoever does not have understanding, whoever does not have faith, whoever does not have love, even what they have, shall be taken away. So we see that abundance brings more abundance. Scarcity brings more scarcity. I'm talking about mindsets here. There is no place for the acts of the flesh in the abundant mindset. Things like hatred, jealousy, selfish ambition, conflict, envy, just to name a few, 
are firmly put in the scarcity mindset. The acts of the flesh shrink, whereas the fruit of the spirit and the abundant mindset only increases. The mindset of scarcity refuses to let go even as what we have slips through our fingers. However, the mindset of abundance is willing to open, to share, to involve, to place, to cultivate, nurture, and grow. The mindset of abundance surrenders to God. The mindset of abundance chooses God. So choose wisely. Hmm. The Bible asks, choose this day whom you will serve. I also love this quote here on the screen that I found, which is attributed to Martin Luther, the reformer. I've held many things in my hands, but I've lost them all. But whatever I've placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Place your life, the most important thing we have, in God's hand. Surrender to God. Allow that mindset of abundance to rule and reign over in our lives. Allow the fruit of the Spirit to be dominant. And we will be given life everlasting, life more abundantly. Mm. Thank you. Thank mm. you.